Best of Baptist Church on Witcher Creek. It's preaching time with Pastor Randy Wilson. Exodus 3 and 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and bring them up out of that land unto a good land, a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and Hittites and Amorites and Perizzites and Hivites and the Jebusites and Mosquito Bites and... Oh, I went too far. <laughs> now, therefore, behold the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say, What is his name? And what shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, <coughs> I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. I want you to notice there in the English uh, <coughs> presentation, it does not say that I used to be God, right. even though he, he, he was. It doesn't say I was. He didn't say, I'm going to be God. But he said, I am. Eternally present. If you're talking about Abraham, he was with Abraham in the eternal presence. If you're talking about the church today, he's with the church in the eternal presence. God is God outside of our creation. Before there ever was time, there was God. In the beginning, in the beginning of what, preacher? In the beginning of time. Yeah. When God created everything, God was already there. And He wasn't a was there, He is an am there. I am that I am. Now, I'm not real good at Hebrew. I did take it, believe it or not, in my studies I know a little Hebrew I used to drive a truck for him he was in the chemical business in those days but we have we have in the English language we have singular and plural singular is one Plural's more than one. Is that right? But now, in Hebrew, it doesn't work that way. There's a difference in the language because they've actually got three. They've got a, a word for the singular. Then they've got a word for two. And then they've got a word for three or more. So the very first time that the word God is mentioned is a word for three or more. But that three or more is joined to a singular verb. Yeah. When he said, when God said, let us make man. It's not the singular and it's not the double, but it's the plural. It's the threefold. Yeah. Let us make man in our image. <laughs> image is singular. 
I, I hope that confused you. I want to go back to this word, I am. I am in the eternal present. I think that many years after Moses, there was a child born in Bethlehem. And that child used those same phrases, I am. I want to preach about that I am today. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for the privilege to pray. Thank you, God, for your blessings on our life. I pray, Father, that you'd help us to realize who we are in Jesus Christ, that by being in Him, Father, we are eternal life. We are everlasting life because we are in Him who is eternal and who is everlasting. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if I could just uh, uh, rabbit trail a little bit. Uh, uh, this, will, this will help you if you can grasp what I'm going to say in the next couple of minutes. This will help you. You are not saved by imparted righteousness. You are saved by imputed righteousness. Uh, righteousness is not imparted to you when you're first saved. It's imputed to you. You say, what's the difference? Real simple. Imparted righteous would mean He would make you righteous. Imputed righteous means He would count you righteous who wasn't righteous. Now, imparted righteous is part of the sanctification process. That little by little, you will grow in the grace and the knowledge of God if you're saved. Amen. The reason a lot of people aren't saved is because, or, or don't grow is because they're not saved to start with. Amen. They're trusting something other than imputed righteousness. Amen. But you've got to come to Jesus uh, as a sinner uh, and say, and I have no righteousness of mine. I need some from you. And so he counts us righteous who weren't righteous. He died for the ungodly. He saved us when we were without strength. But as we grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and we learn from our Bible and, and those old things begin to just dry up and fall off, and uh, uh, righteousness, if you will, is imparted that way. But understand, understand this. You are saved by God counting you righteous when you wasn't. Yeah. That way you won't ever brag Amen. about how good a Christian you are. You'll never brag about, well, I'm better than that guy is. Because the truth of the matter is you both started on level ground. Both of you were deserving of hell. Both of you were sinners in the sight of God. And because God saved you and imparted righteousness to you, you can stand boldly at the throne of grace saying, I'm a child of God, even though I don't even look like a child of God. I am. Boy, that covers a big field. But that's all made possible. Did I pray? I can't remember. I did. Well, thank you, Lord, for somebody can remember. I want to preach about, if I can stay off of the rabbit trail, I want to preach about the I am's of Jesus. Jesus Christ, His birth was a little lower than the angels. I was uh, telling my wife that uh, today, she said, that would be good to preach. Okay, we'll just preach it. Jesus had opportunity to become lower than the angels. Do you know, watch this, that Satan had the same opportunity. God gave him an opportunity to humble himself. But rather than humbling himself, Lucifer exalted himself. No way in the world that I'm going to take a lower position than the angels. But then God said, uh, that one that takes a lower position than the angels, I'm going to exalt him. Well, I'll be exalted without taking a lower position. Boy, isn't that the way a lot of people are today? That's why you don't need a novice in as a pastor because they'll fall into that same condemnation of the devil thinking themselves to be something when they're nothing. And they'll fall into that very same thing. Well, I can be exalted without being humbled. 
But I'm telling you, there is no exaltation without humility. In fact, the Lord Jesus, uh, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, that when he found himself in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself, uh, even to death, uh, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that's above it. He didn't have that name. God gave it to him because he humbled himself and died in our place. God gave him a name that's above every name. Uh, that at the name of Jesus, uh, every one of you turkeys, if you will, is going to bow. Uh, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That he, Jesus Christ, is the I am of the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 6 God said let all the angels of God worship Him. Well Lucifer could have been in on that. He'd have liked that. He'd have liked for all the angels to worship Him. But what you've got is a between Jesus and and the, the highest angel in heaven you've got one that wanted to continue in his pride and you got one that was willing to humble himself and become obedient unto death. Jesus used the phrase over and over, I am. His proclamation is, is refused. They said, we are Abraham's seed. And we don't have to worship him. We're, we're, we're the in crowd. We don't have to bow to anybody because we're Abraham's seed. John chapter 8 and verse 58, Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say I was. He said, I am. Before Abraham was. Jesus claimed to be synonymous with God who brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. The same God who set Israel free from bondage was there as a servant and they didn't recognize Him. The same God who came down to set them free with their prayer here in Exodus 3. That same God came uh, uh, wrapped up in a human being and they just couldn't grasp it. They they didn't believe it could ever be. In John chapter 1, He's the Lamb that they needed for a Passover. In John chapter 3, He's the brazen serpent that was set on the pole. In John chapter 4, He's the living water that if a man drinks, he'll not have to thirst again. John chapter 5, he could do what the law could not do. That man had laid there 38 years and had no help. But Jesus came by and in one day, he helped what the law couldn't do in thousands of years. John chapter 6, He's the bread of life. That if you're hungry, eat of Him. How can this man give us his uh, uh, flesh to eat? We'll talk about that. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, uh, Revelation 22, 13, He said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. John chapter 6, verse 35, He said, I am the bread of life. As a sinner, what we need to be saved is to eat from the bread of life. I'm not talking about the communion table, which is just a symbol of it, but I'm talking about for us to really eat from the bread of life. There were twice in the wilderness that the children of Israel murmured that I want to call your attention to. The first time they murmured, God gave them the bread. You remember? They murmured and they said, we're hungry. And God said, well, here, here's you some manna from heaven. Eat this manna. And they ate that manna. You remember the second time they murmured, God didn't give them bread. God sent fiery serpents among them to bite the people because they're complaining. Amen. How are you doing, preacher? I'm saying that's the way it is in our life. The first thing we need, amen, is to eat of the bread of life. But the second thing we need is not to be complaining about what happens to us after we eat the bread of life. Now Jesus is that living bread. And He imparts His life to us by giving His life on Calvary. He imparts to us a a life for us and death for Him. How can He give us His place to eat? Simply because His place was broken on Mount Calvary. Because He was pierced His hands and His feet. And because of His willingness to give Himself 
just like a grain of wheat is willing to give of itself to produce life. In order for that uh, uh, grain of wheat to produce life, it's got to die. Amen. In order for Jesus to produce life. People don't understand this. They think, well, he can produce life because he, he couldn't produce life because he could just say the word and heal people. He couldn't produce life because he could walk on the storm. He couldn't produce life because he could storm the waves. The only way that he could produce life was to give his life in their place. And on Mount Calvary, he gave his life in our place so that we could have the righteousness of God imputed to us. Hallelujah. Amen. Watch out, preacher. You'll stagger all over the place. Hallelujah. Jesus gave his life so that I could have life. Had he not done that, had he not done that, nobody could be saved. I mean, on, in the Old Testament times, it was just kind of like a credit card deal. They would bring the blood of bulls and goats and, and the, the judgment for their sin would just keep piling up. They were only paying the interest, if you will. Yeah, I, Don't tell me you don't know about credit cards piling up. Amen. They just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Every time you choose to pay the interest, what you got is a bigger debt in the long run. Oh, it'll let you slide. It'll let you buy for that month. But that debt that, that, that just keeps on going up. You think that for thousands of years, the debt just kept piling up. It just kept going and going and going because it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. But when this man came, amen, the whole debt was up, over on his shoulders and he Amen. took my sins Amen. and my sorrows, made them his very own, Amen. bore the burden to Calvary, and suffered and died alone. He's the bread of life. He said, I am the bread of life. They said Moses gave us manna from heaven. He said, oh, no. No, Moses just gave you a type of the manna from heaven. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. If a man eat of my flesh, he shall never die. John chapter 8, verse 12, uh, he, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The same I am of Exodus 3 is saying, I am the light of the world. Now, light is a strange thing. Light convicted the Pharisees. Light converted the very sinful woman that the Pharisees wanted to get rid of. Light opened the blinded eyes and blinded the open eyes, if you will. There's a strange thing about light. I mean, the church of God is like the moon. We don't have any light. Everybody brag about what I got. We don't have, we're just as dark and dead. But what we can do, we can reflect the light, amen, of the sun. You know, this is, a, this is full moon, isn't it? But, around today pretty close uh, uh, is a full moon uh, and, and that's as bright as this moon is ever going to get yeah. then when the world commenced to come in between the moon and the sun then the moon just it gets a little darker and a little darker and just a little sliver directly it looks like it goes clear out why does it go clear out because the world got between it and the sun. What happens to a church that, that its light goes out? Oh, they may have a big congregation. They may have a thousand people, but they don't have any light. And what happens is the world gets between them and the sun. And when the world gets between us and the Son of God, our light goes out. He is the light of the world. We're not the light. He's the light. We came to bear witness of the light, which is the true light that went to bear every man that cometh into the world. Amen. John chapter 10 and verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. I am the door. We are schooled in God's school until a door is opened in heaven. And then we graduate, if you will. One door, so there won't be any confusion. I remember one time we went to a big church in South Carolina, one of those big churches that takes in about an acre of property just for the building. You know what I'm talking about? My mama was with me, and we, we were walking up the, 
from the parking lot up the sidewalk and she said, wonder how you get in here. I said, uh, let's go through the door. Amen. Amen. Which door? Well, there's only one door in Noah's Ark. There's only one door to heaven. Jesus is the door. If we're to go in, and we go in to eat, and we go out to preach. Are you listening to me? We go in to get strength for ourselves. We go out to witness to the world of the grace of God. In always proceeds out. You can't go out till you get in. Amen. There was a couple of skunks. And mommy skunk said to, uh, I think I'll name my babies in and out. And so one day she got to looking around and one of them was missing. And he said, who's missing? And he said, in's missing. Well, said, out, I want you to go get in and bring in in. And so out went out to get in and bring in in. And he found him real quick and he brought him back in and said, there he is, Mom. Amen. 